So let me do that real quick. Um, for the intro, welcome guys. And this audio is being read with the permission of Simon and Shu. But passion lends them power. Time means to meet, tempering extremities with extreme sweet. Okay, so this prologue starts right away. What does the Act 2 prologue say happened to Romeo's love for Rosaline? How is this an example of foreshadowing? Go ahead and write that in your chat box. What does the first line say? Read the first line of this prologue and what does this... Yes, it says it dies, right? Now old desire doth in his deathbed lie. So the old desire, it's dead. That's what happens. He's over Rosaline. It's done. That old desire is death. And how can we consider that foreshadowing for what we know is going to happen to Romeo and Juliet? Yeah, so it's saying that his old desire is dead, but it's ironic because we know that that's what's going to happen to Romeo and Juliet. Okay, let's continue. Can I go forward when my heart is here? Turn back, dull earth, and find thy center out. Romeo! My cousin! All right, what does he mean when he says dull earth? What is Romeo talking about? He starts right away. What is he talking about, dull earth? What is he saying? Go ahead and write that in your chat box. Yeah, he's he wants to go see Juliet, right? He feels that he feels that his body is kind of lifeless. And he's the dull earth in this particular case because he is not with Juliet right now. Um, he wants to turn himself inside out, if he could, to go find what's missing. And what's missing in his heart is Juliet. Romeo! Romeo! He is wise, and on my life hath stolen him home to bed. He ran this way and leapt this orchard wall. Call, good Mercutio. Nay, I'll conjure, too. Romeo! Humors, madman, passion, lover. <laughs> Appear thou in the likeness of a sigh. Speak but one rhyme, and I am satisfied. Cry but I, me. Pronounce but love and dove. Speak to my gossip Venus one fair word, one nickname for her purblind son and heir, young Abraham Cupid. He that shot so trim when King Cophetua loved the beggar maid. <laughs> He heareth not, he stirreth not, he moveth not. The ape is dead, and I must conjure him. I conjure thee by Rosaline's bright eyes, by her high forehead and her scarlet lip, by her fine foot, straight leg, and quivering thigh, and the domains that there adjacent lie, that in thy likeness thou appear to us. All right, so, you know, Mercutio's being a clown, kind of like always, and... Who does he think that Romeo is still in love with here? Go ahead and write that in your chat. Yeah, so if you said Rosaline, he thinks that he's still hung up on Rosaline, then you're absolutely correct. Mercutio has no idea that he's met Juliet. Right? Remember, this is like right after the party and they're looking for Romeo. They're ready, the guys are ready to go. And so what is so funny about this scene? Why is Mercutio being funny in the scene. What makes the scene funny? Go ahead and write that in your chat. He's, if you're saying he's mocking Romeo, absolutely, he's, he's absolutely making fun of Romeo. Um, he is pretending to use witchcraft to conjure up Rosaline's image, hoping that Romeo will show up um, to stare at the ghost that he's conjured up. So Mercutio is kind of being funny and he's being silly and he's making fun of Romeo. Okay, 
going to continue. And if he hear thee, thou wilt anger him. This cannot anger him. T'would anger him to raise a spirit in his mistress' circle of some strange nature, letting it there stand till she had laid it and conjured it down. <laughs> that were some spite. My invocation is fair and honest. In his mistress' name, I conjure only but to raise up him. Come, he hath hid himself among these trees to be consorted with the humorous knight. Blind is his love, and best befits the dark. If love be blind, love cannot hit the mark. Now will he sit under a meddler tree, and wish his mistress with that kind of fruit, as maids call meddlers when they laugh alone. Oh, Romeo, that she were! Oh, that she were an open arse, thou a poprin pear! <laughs> Romeo! Good night! <laughs> I'll to my truckle bed. This field bed is too cold for me to sleep. Come! Shall we go? Go then, for tis in vain to seek him here that means not to be found. He jests at Scar. So they're looking for Romeo. Romeo's hearing them, but he's kind of hiding out from them. He doesn't necessarily want to leave the Capulet estate so quickly. And the guys get tired of calling out his name, and eventually they decide to walk away. Um, this first line is interesting. Romeo says he just has scars that never felt a wound. Um, let's listen. Scars that never felt a wound. But soft. What light through yonder window breaks. All right. So Romeo says he just has scars that never felt a wound. What does he mean by that? What does that mean? Go ahead and write that in your chat box. He's saying basically that Mercutio is making fun of him because Mercutio, what? Exactly. So Mercutio doesn't know what it feels like to really fall in love, to really know what love is. So he's saying, yeah, he just has scars and never felt a wound because he's never, Mercutio has never really been in love. If he were in love, he would know how painful and, and really devastating it, it is. Okay, here we go. Famous speech here. Oops. It is the east. And Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who's already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. It is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. She speaks. Yet she says nothing, what of that? Her eye discourses. I will answer it. I am too bold. Tis not to me she speaks. Two of the fairest stars in all the heaven having some business do entreat her eyes to twinkle in their spheres till they return. <laughs> what if her eyes were there? They in her head. The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight doth a lamp. Her eye in heaven would through the airy region stream so bright that birds would sing and think it were not night. <laughs> See how she leans her cheek upon her hand? Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand. So Romeo is, okay, so I want you to picture this scene. Romeo has just attended the Capulet party. I mean, this is like right after the party. And instead of leaving with his friends, he stayed hanging around the Capulet estate. And he waits for Juliet to show herself or to come out on her balcony. He just wants to get a glimpse of Juliet. So he stays and he's kind of like looking at her from a distance, but you know, he can still see her. 
she doesn't know that he's there. The whole thing in actuality, if you think about it, is a little creepy. Hopefully nobody's ever done this to you and just like stare at you while you're not looking. But he is completely in love and he just wants to take a look at Juliet. Okay, so what does Romeo compare Juliet to in his first speech? What does he what is he comparing Juliet to? Just as he did in scene one, act five. Yes, so he's comparing, if you're saying the sun, he's comparing Juliet to something brilliant, luminous light, some light shining in the dark. Um, this time she is the sun in the nighttime sky is basically what she's saying. Remember that, because that's a very important question. You'll see that later on as well, not only in your discussion, but later on. Hint, hint, you'll see that question as well. He's comparing her to the sun in this famous balcony scene, right? When she's out there in the balcony. Um, she's so bright and pretty, and that makes the moon jealous because she's just amazing, right? So let's listen. That I might touch that cheek. I me. She speaks. Oh, speak again, bright angel, for thou art as glorious to this night, being o'er my head, as is a winged messenger of heaven unto the white, upturned, wondering eyes of mortals that fall back to gaze on him when he bestrides the lazy, puffing clouds and sails upon the bosom of the air. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. Shall I hear more, or shall I speak? All right, let's stop there, because that's one of your discussion questions, and it asks you, in your own words, to rewrite what Juliet just said in lines 33 to 36. So what is Juliet saying? Go ahead and write that in your chat box. Go line by line. It's only three lines, so it shouldn't take you very long. Um, what is Juliet saying? Lines 33, O Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thy will not, be but sworn, my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. What is she saying? Write that in your own words. Yeah, so if you're saying, O Romeo, why do you have to be a Montague? Okay, basically she's saying, and when it's saying change your name, really what does she mean by that? When you change your name, you turn your back on your family, right? So basically she's asking him, turn your back on your family. And then, if she, then she says, or if you can't do that, if you can't turn your back on your family, then what? Yes, then I'll turn my back on my family. I'll leave my family for you is what she's saying. It's very like powerful right from the beginning. Remember, they, these kids just met. Um, and she's already to she's ready to like run off with Romeo. She is completely and totally heads over heels in love with him. Okay, let's continue. Look at this. Tis but by name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself though not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face. Oh, be some other name belonging to a man. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. So Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. So when Julia says that which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet, what does she mean? What does that actually mean? Go ahead and write that in your chat box. Um, think about do names matter in our lives? If you had a different name, do you think you would have grown up like a slightly different person? What does she mean by that? Yeah, but she's saying, yes, she's saying that, you know, names really don't matter, change your name. But she's also saying that, you know, 
it doesn't matter if his name is Romeo or not, or Montague or not, he's still who he is and he's just as wonderful regardless. Like it doesn't matter what his name is. Um, so I want you to think about that question and just think about would you still be the same person if your name wasn't your name? Like if my name was Moonbeam Mendez, would I be a different teacher? You know, Mrs. Moonbeam, you know, would I be a different teacher? Think about your name and think about how important that is in shaping who you are. And that is a discussion question. So we will continue. Romeo, doff thy name, and for thy name, which is no part of thee, take all myself. I take thee at thy word. <gasps> Call me but love, and I will be new baptized. Henceforth, I never will be Romeo. What man art thou that thus bescreened in night so stumblest on my counsel? By a name, I know not how to tell thee who I am. My name, dear saint, is hateful to myself because it is an enemy to thee. Had I it written, I would tear the word. My ears have yet not drunk a hundred words of thy tongue's uttering, yet I know the sound. Art thou not Romeo and a Montague? Neither, fair maid, if either thee dislike. How camest thou hither? Tell me, and wherefore? But the orchard walls are high and hard to climb, and the place death, considering who thou art, if any of my kinsmen find thee here. With love's light wings did I were perch these walls. For stony limits cannot hold love out, and what love can do that dares love attempt? Therefore thy kinsmen are no stop to me. If they do see thee, they will murder thee. Alack, there lies more peril in thine eye than twenty of their swords. <laughs> Look thou but sweet, and I am proof against their enmity. I would not for the world they saw thee here. I have night's cloak to hide me from their eyes. And, but thou love me, let them find me here. My life were better ended by their hate than death prorogued, wanting of thy love. By whose direction foundst thou out this place? By love? That first did prompt me to inquire. <laughs> he lent me counsel. And I lent him eyes. I am no pilot. Yet wert thou as far as that vast shore washed with the farthest sea I should adventure for such merchandise. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face, else would a maiden blush bepaint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak tonight. Fain would I dwell on form, fain, fain deny what I have spoke. But farewell, compliment. Dost thou love me? I know thou wilt say I, and I will take thy word. Yet if thou swearest, thou mayst prove false. At lovers' perjuries they say Jove laughs. O oh, gentle Romeo, if thou dost love, pronounce it faithfully. Or if thou think'st I am too quickly won, I'll frown and be perverse and say thee nay, so thou wilt woo, but else not for the world. In truth, fair Montague, I am too fond, and therefore thou mayst think my behavior light. But trust me, gentlemen, I'll prove more true than those that have more coying to be strange. I should have been more strange, I must confess, but that thou overheard. All right, so let's look at those lines that Julia says. She says, or if thou thinkest I'm too quickly won, I'll frown and be perverse and say thee nay, so thou will woo but else not for the world. In truth, fair Montague, I am too fond. What is Juliet saying? What is the meaning? What is her meaning in those words? What is she saying? Write that in your chat box. What is she saying to him? She's, so if you're saying that she'll change herself to him, she's basically worried that she's coming off like she's kind of desperate, like she is too into him is basically it. She's saying, if you think that I'm like, I'm being too forward and we're moving this too fast, you know, let me know and I'll pretend that I don't like you so much so that you can like me more. Um, basically, she's talking about the games that people often play and still to this day, even not so young people play, when they fall in love, you know, like you, we tend to think that if we show somebody that we love them too much or that we care about them too much, that they will not be interested in us as much. So think about why do other young lovers, both then and now, play these games? Um, 
since Romeo already, you know, remember, he's already heard her admit that she loves him because he was standing there in the dark, like behind the bushes, while she was talking out loud, out loud to herself, right? So think about, she's kind of embarrassed at what he, at what he heard. Okay, so that's a discussion question, and let's move on. First, ere I was where my true love passion. Therefore pardon me, and not impute this yielding to light love, which the dark night hath so discovered. Lady, by yonder blessed moon I vow that tips with silver all these fruit tree tops. Oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon, that monthly changes in her circled orb, lest that thy love prove likewise variable. What? So he says, I swear to you by the moon, you know, like I swear, instead of saying I swear to God, I swear to the moon. Um, and she says, don't swear to the moon. Why does she say, don't swear to the moon? What about the moon? She says, go ahead and write that in your chat box. So if you're saying that the moon changes and you're absolutely right, the moon is in constant, the moon changes all the time. And so don't swear by the moon, by something that changes. So prove your love to me by your own word. You know, do not swear by the moon is basically what she's saying. The moon is here today and literally gone tomorrow. So that's not what our love should be about. Shall I swear by? Do not swear at all. Or if thou wilt swear by thy gracious self, which is the god of my idolatry, and I'll believe thee. If my heart's dear love... Well, do not swear. Although I joy in thee, I have no joy of this contract tonight. It is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden, too like the lightning, which doth cease to be ere one can say it lightens. Sweet, good night. <gasps> this bud of love, by summer's ripening breath, may prove a beauteous flower when next we meet. Good night, good night. As sweet repose and rest come to thy heart as that within my breast. Oh, wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied? What satisfaction canst thou have tonight? The exchange of thy love's faithful vow for mine. I gave thee mine before thou didst request it. And yet I would it were to give again. Wouldst thou withdraw it? For what purpose, love? But to be frank and give it thee again. And yet I wish but for the thing I have. My bounty is as boundless as the sea. My love as deep. All right, so this is an interesting question. It says, which one of them mentions marriage first? And so Romeo, um, she's about to go inside and Romeo says to her, are you gonna leave me so unsatisfied? And Juliet's like, well, what satisfaction do you think you're gonna get? Like, what is it exactly that you're expecting right now? And in a way, she is implying to what? What is she implying that she needs to have, you know, happen before anything can go further between them? Go ahead and write that down. What does she need to happen before they can move on any further in their relationship? He's not talking about, you know, are you going to leave me so like, oh, you're just going to walk away from me? You're going to leave me so unsatisfied right now? And she's like, well, what exactly were you expecting was going to happen tonight? What do you think she's saying to him there? I remember a Beyonce song saying, hey, that's right. You need to put a ring on it. If you like it, you better put a ring on it, right? Like, hey, we need to be married before anything happens. Before anything happens further between us, we need to be married. And what does this really say about Juliet's character, about how she has been brought up and her belief system? So think about that because that's one of the discussion questions. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite. I hear some noise within. Dear love, adieu. Anon, good nurse. Sweet Montague, be true. Stay but a little. I will come again. Oh, blessed, blessed night. 
She says, wait there, I'm I'll be feared right back. being a knight. All this is but a dream. Too flattering, sweet to be substantial. Three words, dear Romeo, and good night indeed. If that thy bent of love be honorable, thy purpose, marriage, send me word tomorrow by one that I'll procure to come to thee, where and what time thou wilt perform the rite. And all my fortunes at thy foot I'll lay, and follow thee, my lord, throughout the world. Madam, I come anon. But if thou meanst not well, I do beseech thee. Madam. By and by I come to cease thy strife and leave me to my grief. Tomorrow will I send. So thrive, my soul. A thousand times, good night. A thousand times the worse to want thy light. Love goes toward love as schoolboys from their books. But love from love. So very quickly, what does Julianne instruct Romeo to send her the next day? She gives her instructions right here. She says, send me something tomorrow. What does she tell him to send her? Go ahead and write that in your chat box. <clears throat> send a message, yes. So if send a message of when and where they are to get married is basically what she says. And he says, okay, I'm gonna, I'll tell you, you'll have the, the information by nine o'clock. You know, like the details of when and where we're going to get married. Towards school with heavy looks. Hist! Romeo, hist! Oh, for a falconer's voice to lure this tasseled gentle back again. Bondage is hoarse and may not speak aloud. Else would I tear the cave where Echo lies and make her airy tongue more hoarse than mine with repetition of my Romeo! It is my soul that calls upon my name. How silver sweet sound lovers' tongues by night. Like softest music to attending ears. Romeo. My dear. What o'clock tomorrow shall I send to thee? Wait, By the hour I, of nine. I will not fail tis twenty year till then. <laughs> <laughs> I have forgot why I did call thee back. Let me stand here till thou remember it. <laughs> I shall forget to have thee still stand there, remembering how I love thy company. And I'll still stay to have thee still forget. Forgetting any other home but this. Tis almost morning. I would have thee gone, and yet no farther than a wanton's bird that lets it hop a little from his hand, like a poor prisoner in his twisted jives, and with a silken thread plucks it back again, so loving jealous of his liberty. I would I were thy bird. Sweet, so would I. Yet I should kill thee with much cherishing. Good night. Good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I shall say good night till it be morrow. Okay, so very quickly, what does it mean when these lines, 182 and 184, they start talking about a bird? What do those lines mean? What is she saying to Romeo? Um, it's interesting because they're talking about a bird, right? And what is she saying to Romeo that she would do to him if, you know, she, if he were a bird, what would she do to him? There's a lot of foreshadowing here, right? So think about this bird. Um, it's almost morning. I would have begun and yet further than a wonton's bird that lets it hop a little from her hand. She would give him so much love that she would end up killing him. It's basically what she says. And it's all foreshadowing, right? Like all this love that they have for each other, it's, is, it, is it really good or is it toxic? Like what's happening here? All right, so let's go on. Leap, dwell upon thine eyes. Peace in thy breast. Would I were sleep and peace so sweet to rest. Hence will I to my ghostly friar's close cell his help to crave and my dear hap to tell. The gray-eyed morn smiles. Okay, so very quickly before we start this scene, scene three, Romeo goes from Capulet's garden to the monastery where Friar Lawrence lives. 
the friar knows Romeo well and often gives him advice. So he's the one who's been given, ro giving Romeo advice. As the scene begins, Friar Lawrence is gathering herbs in the early morning. He talks of good and bad uses for herbs. So he's like a medicinal man. He gets all these herbs and he uses them for good and bad purposes, right? Keep this in mind, since Friar Lawrence, skill, he's skilled at mixing herbs and it becomes important later on in the play. Romeo tells the friar that he loves Juliet and wants to marry her. The friar is amazed that Romeo has forgotten about Rosaline so easily and suggests that Romeo might be acting in haste. Eventually, however, he agrees to marry Romeo and Juliet, hoping that the marriage will end the feud between their families. So what's important here is remember Romeo promised Juliet to have word to her by nine o'clock. And so he's going out there and he's going to try to make the arrangement for their wedding. And now guys, this is like day two. Like they just met last night, you know, or that same night and they're already planning for their wedding on day two. So. On the frowning night, checkering the eastern clouds with streaks of light and fleckled darkness like a drunkard reels from forth day's path and titan's fiery wheels. Now, ere the sun advances burning eye, the day to cheer and night's dank dew to dry, I must upfill this osier cage of ours with baleful weeds and precious juiced flowers. The earth, that's nature's mother, is her tomb. What is her burying grave? That is her womb. And from her womb, children of diverse kind, we sucking on her natural bosom find. Many for many virtues excellent, none but for some, and yet all different. Oh, mickle is the powerful grace that lies in plants, herbs, stones, and their true qualities. For not so vile that on the earth doth live, but to the earth some special good doth give. Nor aught so good, but strained from that fair use, revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice, being misapplied, and vice, sometime by action, dignified. Within the infant rind of this weak flower, poison hath residence, and medicine power, for this being smelt, with that part cheers each part, being tasted, stays all senses with the heart. To such opposed kings encamp them still in man, as well as herbs, grace and rude will. And where the worser is predominant, full soon the canker death eats up that plant. Good morrow, Father. So the first question in your discussion for this particular scene is, what is the friar doing? Go ahead and write the answer in your chat. What is the friar, is Friar Lawrence doing in this particular opening? What is he talking about? What is he doing? Yeah, so if you're saying that he's gathering herbs and flowers in a basket, then your answer is absolutely correct. His hobby is herbology, and he likes to investigate the medicinal and poisonous properties of plants and flowers. Okay, again, remember that because that's going to be important later on. Benedicite, what early tongue so sweet saluteth me, young son. It argues that distempered head so soon to bid good morrow to thy bed. Care keeps his watch in every old man's eye, and where care lodges, sleep will never lie. But where unbruised youth with unstuffed brain doth couch his limbs, there golden sleep doth reign. Therefore thy earliness doth me assure thou art uproused with some distemperature. Or if not so, then here I hit it right, our Romeo hath not been in bed tonight. That last is okay. So let's stop real quick. Um, according, so when he was gathering the herbs, Friar Lawrence, and just in case you're curious as to what a friar is, a friar is like a Catholic priest. Um, so he says that how he's talking about humans and plants, and basically he's talking about how humans are like plants, basically, in that 
we have both goodness and darkness in us, right? And so these plants that he's looking at have both medicinal powers and they also have powers to hurt people as well. And he's comparing humans to plants here. Um, again, that's a little bit more like foreshadowing into the future. Um, why, with whom does Friar Lawrence that night when Romeo comes in, who does he think that Romeo has been with all night? Go ahead and write that down in your chat. With whom does Friar Lawrence assume Romeo has spent the night? Yeah. Everybody thinks that Romeo is still in love with Rosaline, right? This is kind of like a shocker. This was very fast with Juliet. Um, the Friar thinks that he was with Rosaline, you know, his old crush. It's true. The sweeter rest was mine. God pardon sin. Was that with Rosaline? <laughs> with Rosaline, my ghostly father. No, I have forgot that name and that name's woe. That's my good son. But where hast thou been then? I'll tell thee ere thou ask it me again. I have been feasting with mine enemy, where on a sudden one hath wounded me that's by me wounded. Both our remedies within thy help and holy physic lies. I bear no hatred, blessed man. For lo, my intercession likewise steads my foe. Be plain, good son, and homely in thy drift. Riddling confession finds but riddling shrift. Then plainly know my heart's dear love is set on the fair daughter of rich Capulet. Oh. As mine on hers, so hers is set on mine, and all combined, save what thou must combine, by holy marriage. Oh. When and where and how we met, we wooed and made exchange of vow, I'll tell thee as we pass. But this I pray, that thou consent to marry us today. Holy Saint Francis, what a change is here. Is Rosaline that thou didst love so dear, so soon forsaken? Young men's love then lies not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. Yes. Wow, that's deep, right? He says, hey, young men's love then lies not truly in their hearts, but in their eyes. So basically he's saying that, you know, then you just fell in love with Rosaline because she was pretty. And then you found somebody that was prettier and then you got over Rosaline just like that. Okay, let's go on. Oh, Maria, what a deal of brine hath washed thy sallow cheeks for Rosaline. How much salt water thrown away in waste to season love that of it doth not taste. The sun, not yet thy sighs from heaven clears, thy old groans yet ringing in mine ancient ears. Lo, here upon thy cheek the stain doth sit of an old tear that is not washed off yet. If e'er thou wast thyself, and these woes thine, thou and these woes were all for Rosaline, and art thou changed? Pronounce this sentence, then, women may fall when there's no strength in men. Thou chidst me oft for loving Rosaline. For doubting, not for loving, pupil mine. And bad'st me bury love. Not in a grave to lay one in, another out to have. I pray thee, chide me not. Her I love now doth grace for grace and love for love allow, the other did not so. Oh, she knew well thy love did read by rote that could not spell. But so that's interesting. Well, she said He says that she knew, in other words, Rosaline knew that you were not really in love with me. Reading by rote is, um, rote is like a form of memorization. So it's like when you learn what the words look like, but you don't know how to read. It's like how when a kid passes a McDonald's when they're very little and they right away, they know that that's a McDonald's because they know the sign, they know the symbol, not necessarily because they know how to read the word McDonald's, right? And so what she, what Friar Lawrence is telling Romeo is that Rosaline knew that your love wasn't true, that you were basically, what you did was that you memorized the rules of love, but you don't really know how to love is what, Friar Lawrence is telling Romeo. But come, young waverer, come, go with me. In one respect, I'll thy assistant be, for this alliance may so happy prove to turn your household's rancor to pure love. Oh, let us hence. I stand on... So he's not necessarily for this marriage with Juliet. I don't think that Friar Lawrence believes that Romeo's love is true, but he says he will help him why does he say he'll help him? Go ahead and write that down in your chat box. Let me see if you got that. Why does Friar Lawrence finally agree to help Romeo marry Juliet? Yeah, so if you're saying to stop this feud between the families, then you're absolutely correct. He wants this, this, 
rancor between these two families has gone on and on and on. And perhaps marrying these two kids from these two families that hate each other will ease some of the tension. Sudden haste, wisely and slow, they stumble and run fast. That is the end of scene three. And, you know, Friar Lawrence leaves us with the words wisely and slow, they stumble that run fast. In other words, go slower. You tend to pay more attention to what you do when you go slower. Um, going fast and doing things, rushing into things is not necessarily the right thing to do all the time. Um, so those are some wise words from Friar Lawrence. We went over all the discussion questions for our for both the answers for today and tomorrow. So if you log into Edsby today, I recommend that you do um, the discussion questions right after attending the Zoom um, because we've gone over all of them. And then tomorrow you'll be able to answer those questions as well because we just went over. All right, let me know if you have any questions. I will be online all day today to answer your questions. Um, and all right, good luck guys. Get to writing. Also, don't forget to journal today, okay? You want to meet those 500 words um, per day goal as much as you possibly can. It'll make your life easier, and that way you don't have any writing to do on the weekend, too. All right, have a good day. Stay safe.